Thank you, Lucio. So, welcome. Um, I will um, present you uh, the, the Rosby code, which uh, it's a code that I designed for the study of protoplanetary disk, um, and in particular to study the dust dynamics in this disk. And we are using it in, at the University of Zurich, and I'm working mainly with Lucio uh, there. Um, as an introduction, uh, because maybe some of you are not familiar with, uh, with astrophysics. Um, this is a, an observation that we can do now with uh, the ALMA uh, telescope of a protoplanetary disk. And you could see uh, in this uh, millimeter wavelengths the emission of small grain dust, a small dust grain that uh, are embedded in this disk. And you, you can see some structures, like ring-like structures. And it's, uh, we can see more and more of these, uh, of these objects, like this one also, uh, TW Idrae, which is a, um, a recent observation also. And uh, the challenge in um, theoretical astrophysics is to explain these structures. And um, uh, some assumption or some um, processes could be, uh, um, could be invoked for that, like uh, the presence of a planet or many planets or some instabilities. And, um, um, also, we would like to know if these uh, structures are transient or uh, they are long longer lived, uh, because these observations are only snapshots of, of the disk evolution. So this is the challenge we are tackling. Um, and in particular, as concerned the formation of planets, um, the, the dynamics of the dust grains is very important because um, planetesimal asteroids and planetary core uh, are formed from these uh, millimeter or micrometer grains. So uh, how do they grow to these uh, big sizes is, um, is exactly the, the problem in the, in the theory. Um, some processes are invoked like vortices uh, because they capture the, the solid and so they increase the dust density which is required for, for the grain growth processes or uh, for the gravitational collapse that uh, could uh, 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 follow this uh, this uh, concentration, um, and uh, there is also what is called the streaming instability, which is um, a process that uh, is able to con uh, concentrate also the the solid material, like you can see on the on the top on the bottom uh, right. Uh, the development of this instability creates dust uh, filaments that could be uh, gravitationally unstable. But the problem is that uh, the assumptions require high initial uh, dust uh, densities, which uh, is not what we observe in DISC. So we, we, sh we need to find other, other processes. Uh, for that, we do numerical simulations, and uh, the code ROSB uh, is one of the tools that you could use for that. Um, I designed I design this, uh, this code from scratch uh, in, uh, with in mind uh, to, to, to have the, the, the good tool for uh, the protoplanetary disk uh, systems. Uh, it's, uh, uh, for the moment, it's mainly used in 2D uh, polar coordinates. Uh, we study uh, the full disks, I mean uh, the full 2 pi azimuthal extent. Uh, and uh, it, it, it works also in 3D spherical um, to fit the symmetry of the system where you have a central star and the, the gravitational potential is spherical, in fact. Uh, it's a finite volume approach using, um, uh, I know it's written <laughs> after that, but yes, on the fixed grid, there is no moving mesh or no refinement for the moment, but uh, it's very good for uh, brute uh, calculation on clusters because it's, it's very uh, well uh, load balanced. Uh, it's a second order in time with a Rinkuta scheme and uh, which is enough to capture shock problems. And uh, in space we use parabolic reconstruction of the cell uh, structures to find the fluxes. Uh, some, something similar to what um, maybe a bit simpler that uh, Paul uh, uses. Uh, the second speaker, and uh, we have implemented in, in particular a well-balanced scheme that uh, reduce uh, the, the, the numerical errors induced by the, the radial profile of this disk. In fact, um, and we solve. We want to solve uh, the, Euler, the conservative equations, like you could see on the on the on the bottom, 
where you have the time variation of Euler quantity, density, uh, um, quantity of movement, and energy. That is the integral of our time step of the flux terms plus the integral of our time step of source, which is the gravity, geometrical uh, accelerations, and other external forces. And in the and the, the time integration is, uh, as in Renkuta, you have uh, this equation on the, on the bottom, which relates the, the variation of the time step as a linear combination of an estimate at half the time step and the values at the beginning. So this is uh, the basics. Uh, here I show the result that we obtain with the well-balanced scheme. Uh, on the top uh, left and, and bottom left, you see the radial velocity in the disk, and uh, on the bottom, the density, you could see that uh, if you don't use a well-balanced scheme, you have significant errors that appear. And uh, on the right, you see the results using this well-balanced scheme. And then the, the, the background flow, I mean the steady state of the disk, is well uh, evolved in, in time. After 200 rotations, you see that the density is less than 10 to the minus 11. So it's very efficient to do long-term simulations. Um, here I show um, how we, we parallelize the, the code, uh, something uh, technical. Uh, in fact, this code is, um, uh, the parallelization is, is uh, based on discretization of the, of the domain. Um, here, for example, on the, on, the, on the bottom, you have the radius of the disk, and uh, in vertical, you have the azimuthal extent, so you see it's uh, periodic from 0 to 2 pi, so it's the full disk, but here represented in a kind of square. Um, and uh, this domain is split in, in uh, 2D uh, patches, uh, 2D blocks that are distributed to different nodes. Here, it's, uh, as an example, it's for 16 nodes, and uh, each node computes the evolution of uh, the, the grid cells in, embedded in the block, and they exchange only the, uh, some ghost cells that are used for the scheme. <coughs> um, we have implemented recently uh, the overlap, I mean the uh, non, non um, um, how do you call that? Yeah, uh, the overlap of communication of these ghost cells with the calculation to reduce as, min, as, uh, as much as possible the, the, the waiting for the communication between the nodes. So for, with this uh, parallelization approach, yeah, I didn't mention that uh, for sure on, on each block we use the OpenMP, all the cores available on the node. And um, here I show you some results about the, the, how uh, it scales on Pitsdaint. Uh, for block size of 128 and by 256, uh, we obtain a very good scaling. Uh, so it's a strong scaling in this case. Um, for for uh, so for up to 256 nodes for a resolution of 2,000 by 4,000, and uh, up to 1,000 nodes, so more than 10,000 cores uh, for a bigger uh, resolution. For sure, if you, if you increase the number of nodes for a given resolution, you have to reduce the size of the blocks. And you could see on the right that um, uh, the last points, which where the efficiency is on, or, around 50%, it's the case where we have reduced the block size, and then the communication is not very efficient because the, the size of the, of the boundaries, the ghost cell that you send with MPI is too small, and you reduce the bandwidth of the of the network. So you wait too much and uh, it doesn't increase the, the time of communication and so you wait for the, com the communications. But uh, it's a, it's a, we have a slight improvement with the uh, overlap of calculation, but uh, yes, it's a limitation. But uh, we have enough resolution to do our studies. Um, here now I, I introduce uh, what is typical in the Rosby code is the multi-fluid approach to, to solve the, the dynamics of the solid grains. Um, so we imagine that we have a solid grain embedded in the disk. Uh, this grain, uh, the, the movement of this grain will be uh, due, due to the neutron law, uh, will be due to the gravitation of the star, the friction with the gas, the drag interaction, and some collisions with other grains. Um, in fact, most of the acceleration is compensated by the gravitational uh, 
force of the, of the star. And so you are left with the main contribution from the friction and maybe from collisions. And if the distance of efficiency uh, of the drug is uh, smaller uh, than the, the distance, the mean distance between the grains, the, the collisions are unlikely because the grains will all be uh, 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 limited by the, the friction with the gas. And so all the grains will follow, finally, the, the gas motion, and then they, there will be a collective motion imposed by the, by the gas. And so we could treat the motion of the solids as a fluid because there is this collective motion and, and, and uh, collisions between grains will be unlikely. Uh, for sure, so if there is no collision, this, this motion, will, uh, this fluid will be pressureless. Uh, so we, are, we implement that uh, in, in the fluid equation of the solid grains. And um, the problem is when the friction is on very short time scale, then uh, it's hard to uh, implement an explicit uh, scheme for the force uh, calculation in the, in the uh, conservative equations. So uh, it's uh, the problem that we have to, to overcome. Um, and I, I show you how we, we managed to do that. Um, so here a bit of, mat, uh, of math. <laughs> um, I, if I call P, big P, vector, a big vector P, the, the uh, quantity of movement, which is uh, density times the velocity, uh, we could write the conservation of movement for the gas, the first equation. The variation is due to uh, an operator A, which is advection plus gravity plus uh, every external source uh, terms. And you have uh, omega over stocks times the difference between the, the quantity of movements, which is the drag between the, the, the two fluids. And the second equation is the same for the particle fluids, and you could see that the interaction is of opposite sign because of action-reaction. And uh, if we start with these two equations and we replace uh, the, the two, uh, we subtract the two, uh, we could uh, find an equation over only the difference between the two impulsions, delta p. And then we could write only one equation, assuming that uh, the densities over the time step are almost constant. We could write a, a single equation, which has the form of an exponential uh, differential equation. I mean, a first order differential equation, sorry. And over the time step, we could find an, an, an implicit solution of this equation, which is in the form of exponentials. Uh, um, and so um, if we neglect the term in, uh, you could see that uh, the last term, which depends on the advection and, and, and source terms, uh, is, is usually much smaller than the term, the first term in delta p. You could see here why. Um, you have two regimes where the stocks, the omega, which is the, depends on the grain size, um, is very small, and delta t also. Uh, then this term is uh, 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 an order, uh, is third order, so you cannot capture it anyway. Uh, and um, when uh, the, the, the grain size is very small, so when omega uh, p is very large, then uh, you are in the short fric friction limit. And then in this case, if omega is very large, you could see that the last term, delta a over omega, goes to zero. So it could be neglected also. And here I show. Um, what we obtain for all the values of omega uh, uh, between one to very large. And uh, you could see that the, 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 the plain line is the result uh, the term in, in uh, delta p, and the dashed line in the, is the term that is left from the advection. And you could see that it's always uh, much uh, many orders of magnitude lower. In, in fact, it's uh, delta t, the time step, lower. So it could be neglected. And uh, oh. yeah. And finally, uh, if we integrate over a time step, we find the variation of the impulsion of the, the, of the uh, quantity of movement of the two fluids, which is the integral of advection that we compute with the second order Renkuta, and the integral of the friction that we, uh, here we compute uh, analytically from the solution we have just uh, shown before. And uh, the value is uh, given by equation 8. And so we could only implement this equation 
and replace delta p by the values we have in the in the code in each grid cell, and also um, the dust to gas ratio epsilon. And uh, with these numerical values, we could compute the drag force between the two fluids. And we could expand this uh, solution to a second dust fluid. Then we have a system of three equations. The first is the the, the variation of uh, movement of the gas, and uh, which depends on the drag with the two fluids, and the uh, two dust fluids, and the two last equations are the variation of movement of each dust fluid. And if we combine uh, the, sa the same way we did before, we, could, we end up with two equations of the, variation of the difference between the gas and the, and the dust fluid for each uh, population. And uh, it's a differential uh, equation, first order, uh, differential equation system. It's linear and we could compute the solution of this by the exponential of the matrix of this linear system. And we have implemented it in, in the numerical way. And uh, we, also, we are also able to find the same kind of linear system with a third uh, dust fluid for which we could have an analytical exponential of the matrix uh, solution. Then more would be more difficult, but uh, at least two or three fluids are enough for our studies. Um, okay, so I show now some examples of the numerical results we could obtain with this code. Um, uh, the, first, the, the first study we did is uh, to study the capture of these solids in, inside uh, large-scale vortices, which has been uh, uh, introduced uh, decades ago as a good process to concentrate the solids. And, uh, but once, once you have the full coupling between the solids and the gas, in fact, we observe an instability of this vortex <coughs> that you could see here. After, it's after a, a few uh, dozen of orbits. Um, so on the top, you see the dust density of the, in, the, in the disk. Uh, on the abscess, it's the radius, and azimuth, uh, it's uh, the, in vertical, it's azimuth. So it's a kind of a square representation of the full disk. And uh, you see a, 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 a packet of solids that is uh, uh, at the location of the vortex. And for sure, on the, on the bottom, you could see the, the Rossby number, which is the uh, parametrization of the vorticity. So you could really see that it's a patch of negative vorticity, an anticyclonic vortex. But at the center, you could see some structures that are uh, uh, inherent from the instability that develops inside the vortex. And the dust density has increased by a factor of 100 or more compared to the initial values. So it's very efficient to capture, uh, but uh, at one point it, it uh, develops an instability. And the, the plot shows uh, uh, for different grain size, maybe you cannot exactly see, but uh, um, on the left, uh, the, first, uh, the first line is for the bigger grains, and the, the, the most um, shallower uh, plot is for the smallest grains. So you could see that the capture here, it's the increase of the dust density in the, in the vortex center, uh, has an exponential uh, form, and uh, is well, uh, is well uh, modelized by a linear uh, mo analysis, with, which, is, uh, which uh, are these uh, color lines. So we could capture uh, with, the, with the numerical method uh, this uh, effect, even for very small grains, such number of 10 to the minus 3, which corresponds to less than a millimeter of those grains. Uh, so this is very, uh, very uh, efficient, uh, even with the, these very small grains, for which the implicit method uh, um, works. <laughs> and then after the vortex instability, the vortex is sheared away and left in the, uh, and, and leave in the disk a kind of ring structure that you could see here for the dust uh, density. Uh, on the left, it's the dust density left after um, 800, uh, um, yes, 800 uh, orbits. And you could see some very small eddies which are very dense up to a thousand times the, the disk background, which correspond to almost the, more than the density that uh, or in the gas structures. And on the right, you have the same result, but for a smaller grain. You see it's uh, 10 to the minus 3, and on the left it was four times uh, larger. No, it was uh, 4 10 to the minus 2, 40 times. And you can see that for smaller grains, the structures are smoother, maybe a bit wider, 
but may, uh, probably we have to, uh, to confirm with a convergence study if we could not catch smaller size uh, structures with higher resolution. Um, I show now uh, the same kind of, uh, of setup with a vortex, but with two different sizes of, of grains at the same time. So they are fully coupled with the gas, which means that uh, on, the, on the left you have a grain size that corresponds to a stock number of 0.25, uh, which is quite, uh, quite large. Um, and so you could see that it's, it's well uh, confined in the vortex. Uh, and on the right, it's 10 times uh, smaller. And you could see that on the right, finally, the smaller grains are not uh, very efficiently uh, confined. At that time, uh, it's after 20 rotations. And uh, so it means that the, the bigger the grains, the, the fastest they are confined in the vortices. Um, oh, here. here, it's after uh, 50 rota uh, 60 rotations. So a bit later, you could really see on the top the vortice, in the vorticity the, the vortex instability, where it's uh, very uh, destroyed. You have small-scale structures. You have the generation of a bigger vorticity. And um, it's very well of, uh, overlying with the density of the larger grains on the bottom left, uh, where the density is uh, uh, the, the local dust-to-gas ratio is larger than 10 in this case. And uh, surprisingly, the, the smallest grains do not show these uh, compact structures, but follow uh, a mean, uh, follow more the, the shape of the, vortici of the vorticity. Um, and you could see uh, really this segregation between the grain size. Uh, the biggest are very compacted, and the smallest uh, are more um, on, on, a, on a larger area of the, of the vortex patch. But they are more dense than uh, you could compare here at 20 orbits. Now you have a density that is significantly improved uh, after 60 orbits. And then later on, the vortex, you could see how it is sheared in the disk. So it's elongated, and some st you could see that some packets uh, on the top, around uh, azimuth 5, are uh, ejected and are uh, Attract, uh, dragged with the, the dust, uh, the largest dust um, fluid. On the bottom left, you could see uh, how dense it is in this region, even if it's now not in the vortex. And this uh, packet of uh, very dense uh, dust uh, drives uh, with, with it uh, the gas. And that's why we have a very large vorticity uh, generation around on the top, around uh, azimuth 5. And, uh, but it doesn't drag uh, that much the smallest grains. The smallest grains are more confined in the, in the remnant of the, of the vortex uh, around azimuth uh, one, two, three. Um, so you have really uh, uh, um, this difference between the, uh, where, where you could find the smallest grains. Imagine you could observe it with Alma. You could find uh, a, a kind of vortex in this region. But in fact, with the larger grains will be uh, in, an, in another position in the disk. And later on, uh, you, you, you form these dust rings with this turbulent zonal flow that you could see on the top. And uh, with a very turbulent uh, region associated with the large grains. And the smallest grains are more dissipated. And, and they, are, they are still following the remnant of the vortex, in fact. And later on, uh, you, have, uh, you obtain a, a strong dust, a very narrow dust ring, very dense, and, uh, and, the, and the, the smallest grains are, more, are in a larger patch of the disk. So you could, if you could uh, do observations in two different wavelengths, you could see different structures because the, the grains are not captured in the same way um, in vortices depending on their size. And the last example is um, uh, we, we want to mimic uh, the, these disk observations uh, with the presence of a planet. We have inputted a, a, a Earth mass planet, um, uh, uh, sorry, a 20 Earth mass planet in the disk, and we let it evolve with one uh, dust population. And you see, after a while, uh, the, the planet is able to carve a bit the disk. On the, t on the left, you have the gas density, and on the right, you have the dust density, which is accumulated at the outer edge of the gap. 
and develops after here uh, almost 60 orbits this ring instability that we have observed. But uh, what is in interesting is that this planet is still in a migration regime, so it migrates inward, and then it generates, as, as it moves inward, uh, the conditions for triggering this ring instability, and you form a second dust ring that you could see on the, on the right with the dust density that develops, uh, and as long as the planet migrates, it will trigger uh, different dust rings that are separated uh, because of the uh, radial uh, in inward motion of the of the planet and also so of the of the planetary gap and uh, we could generate this kind of ring structure that you could observe with Alma only with one planet so there is no need for many planets to form many rings but in this setup uh, we could imagine that one planet that is still migrating could generate different dust rings. Uh, so I come to my conclusions. This code uh, Rosby is uh, very efficient in solving the complexity of protoplanetary disk with high order um, multifluid, and uh, and we have we have seen that these implicit solutions are necessary to to study the the small grain regime, which are what we observe and which are. Uh, the, these grains are from which, from what we start uh, the, the planetary formation processes. So it's important to, to know the dynamics of these uh, small grains. Uh, in fact, they evolve in the disk. Uh, in the, they are captured in, in the vortices and in vorticity uh, zonal flows, uh, it, almost in the same way as the bigger grains, but it's just on longer time scales. And finally, they are able to form these dust rings that we observe with larger grains. Uh, these multifluid uh, simulations with different po dust population could explain uh, some disk observation and uh, it could be a, a good uh, tool uh, to, to predict uh, multi-wavelength observation of this disk because these multi-wavelengths will track different grain size. And, uh, and also we could extract the, the, the velocity uh, difference between the two solid population which could uh, uh, allow to infer the impact velocity between these two uh, uh, grains, uh, small and, and, and large, for example. And uh, with this method, we could uh, predict and, and give some input to the grain growth model where they need the collision velocity, for example. And, um, and when you have a setup with super Earth, it's very interesting because it could explain these multi-ring observations that we could find with, uh, we could uh, uh, produced with ALMA and other uh, telescopes. Thank you. Yes, we have time for only one quick question, given that we are a bit delayed. If someone wants to ask one. Yes. How I am doing? How are you doing the matrix exponential, that three by three matrix exponential? Um, in fact, it, you, you, you could find an analytical solution of this uh, matrix because uh, uh, you need uh, to diagonalize the matrix because the exponential of uh, a matrix, if it's uh, diagonalizable, is uh, only the, uh, the product of the... Uh, um, the I don't know the name in English, the, the, this matrix of uh, um, P and, and P minus one, and then at the middle you have this uh, diagonal uh, matrix uh, with the, uh, the eigenvalues at the exponential. So you, have to, you need to find the eigenvalues of uh, this three by three uh, linear system. And uh, so it's a, a polynomial of th a third order for which you could find an analytical solution. So it's easy. That's why uh, if you have four dust species, then it will be hard to find an analytical solution of um, uh, a fourth order polynomial. And then it's only to find the, how you diagonalize this matrix, I mean to find the, the eigenvectors. Uh. <laughs> so Paul is... Uh, 